Hello. Uh, I can see some people just beginning to arrive. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Luke Hopping. I'm with Micromobility Industries. We're a blog, a newsletter, a podcast, uh, event series uh, focusing on the future of urban mobility by lightweight electric vehicles, uh, primarily personal electric vehicles like scooters and bikes. But also in that category, we include lightweight electric vehicles such as delivery robots and other little autonomous creatures and machines that move around or want to move around our sidewalks and bike lanes and streets. Um, in that spirit, I am here today with an excellent panel to discuss what the future holds for these devices and our cities uh, as it relates to delivery, something we've talked a lot about at Curbivore over the past two days. I'm joined by a really great panel, um, but first I want to introduce our, the moderator of this panel, Michelle Kairouz. Michelle Kairouz is the host of the Smarter Cars podcast, which is a uh, kind of serialized uh, seasonal uh, podcast series about the future of transportation, and as the title would imply, a big deal of it is about, a great deal of it is about uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, she is also the author of a ter terrific new book. I would totally recommend you guys check it out. It's one of the first kind of uh, handbooks devoted to micro mobility, new mobility in general, um, all the changes we've seen happening in the last couple of years about how cities are trying to take cars off the road and transform their urban spaces. Um, but we've seen kind of flying around on Twitter and blog posts and uh, podcasts, but haven't really seen put into book form yet. She wrote a great book about it called The New Mobility Handbook. I'm going to drop a link to that uh, in the chat as soon as I stop talking. So you guys can check it out if you're interested. Um, but without any further ado, Michelle, thank you so much for being here. And I'm going to let you take the reins. Thanks so much for that nice introduction, Luke. Uh, let me introduce our panel. Uh, Julia leads mobility innovation for Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti's office, where she's liaison to the transportation technology community and drives public private initiatives. Previously, Julia led innovation and technology for cities at Siemens US. She's also an adjunct faculty member at the USC uh, Price School of Public Policy and sits on the board of Urban Movement Labs. Also, we have Dimitri. Dimitri is the co-founder of Tortoise. Prior to founding Tortoise, he uh, created and led Uber's mobility partnership initiatives, and he serves as an advisor to a number of mobility companies. And then we have Matt. Matt is the co-founder of Refraction AI. He has worked in autonomous vehicles since the first DARPA Grand Challenge in 2004. He has a PhD from the University of Sydney and is an associate professor of robotics at the University of Michigan. So welcome to our panelists. Um, and let's get started talking about delivery. Um, just so that everyone has an idea of what these two companies uh, who we have on the panel, what, what they do and what their services look like. Let's start there. Matt, maybe you could start us off. Tell us what Refraction AI does. Give us a picture. What does your vehicle look like? How do you operate? How do people use the service? Uh, give us a little picture about what you're doing. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so what we do at Refraction AI is we build um, uh, autonomous vehicles that are about the size of a human on a bike, and they travel in the margin of the road next to the curb um, about 10 to 15 miles an hour, and we do last mile delivery, so delivery in a three, three and a half mile radius. Um, and right now we're doing grocery and uh, prepared food. Um, so the vehicles have 12 cameras, ultrasound, millimeter wave radar, and a forward looking solid state LIDAR. And they use that to navigate um, in much the same way you would with a full-size autonomous vehicle. So your vehicle, and people can see this if they want to pull it up, is it refraction.ai? Is that the website? Yep. Yeah. Yep. See a little video of this if people want to see what it looks like. But how, how big is the the actual vehicle? You're, you're technically an electric bike, right? Mm -hmm. We are about six, about five and a half feet tall, about six feet long and about 32 inches wide. So um, it comes up to my shoulders and is about as long as a, as a kind of traditional passenger bike. You can see a bike in the background here, uh, similar to that. And so we aimed for a size and weight profile. It's about 125 pounds. That was very similar to a human on a bike. And so um, that was sort of the jumping off point for um, building that vehicle. And it, if you're familiar with the recumbent trike, um, it looks very similar. It has three wheels, two in the front, uh, one in the, in the rear, and that's the drive. 
And so it's a tadpole um, trike design if uh, for the and recumbent so trike fans in the house. Right, so you're, these vehicles operate autonomously and uh, travel, you said, about three mile delivery uh, radius. Yep. That's right, that's right. And um, yeah, we're, we're using sort of the margin of the road. And so the idea is um, to be between uh, cars and the uh, side of the road like you would with your bike. I'm really trying to model um, uh, what it would be to be a bike courier, but with just data human on it uh, in most ways. Okay. And do you use teleoperation to keep an eye on your autonomous uh, pods? We do, we do. So it's a blend of, of teleoperation and, and autonomy. And, you know, um, I've been a strong proponent for many years that um, the full autonomy problem in all scenarios and all weathers is really, really hard to solve. And so we believe that um, uh, for us, the right way to do that is with a blend. And so um, that's what we've been doing here in Ann Arbor. We've been deployed now uh, maybe nine, 10 months almost. Uh, so we went through last winter and we're coming into this winter. So it's exciting and a lot of fun. Um, Ann Arbor for everyone know, is a little college town and we have about 150,000 people here. And so we do um, deliveries to students when they're not, um, well, I guess now when they're stuck in their dorms due to COVID. Um, I heard that they were quarantining the University of Michigan students because they were infecting the rest of the town. <laughs> the, whether they're infected or what else is, is unclear, but they are definitely quarantined now. The state, uh, sorry, the county put out a stay at home order just for undergrads, which is, um, I don't know if, how that works from a legal perspective, but I guess they're not a protected class, but yeah, undergrads are not allowed to leave their uh, houses these days. All right, I guess everyone needs delivery. Uh, <laughs> great, so um, Dimitri, tell us about Tortoise, uh, where you guys operate, what your vehicle looks like, and what you're doing with delivery. Awesome, well, thank you everyone for, uh, for inviting me today. It's an honor to be part of this great panel, um, and we're excited for it. And so Tortoise was founded with two key insights when uh, we're thinking about the future of automation on public rights of way. Uh, insight one is that low speed comes before high speed, uh, hence the name Tortoise. And, and the second is uh, remote control comes before autonomous. Uh, so we focus uh, right now on 100% teleoperated solutions. And, and because of that, we're able to make light electric vehicles or work with OEMs that make light electric vehicles that, that are very affordable today and, and can begin uh, scalable commercial deployments today, not waiting for breakthroughs in new technologies. And so in delivery, we've built our own uh, remote controlled sidewalk delivery cart that is really optimized for grocery, uh, retail and parcel delivery. It can carry a hundred plus pounds. Uh, and the best way to think of it is it's like an electric wheelchair uh, then instead of a seat, it has, has a wagon in, wagon in it that can fit modular containers with locks that are Bluetooth controlled. And it's got an electronics pole that allows for the remote uh, control. And we have a teleoperation center in Mexico City. Uh, and so one, one way to think about us from an economic value prop point of view is we're trying to do for last mile delivery what globalized call centers did for uh, customer support. Uh, take what was previously a very expensive uh, mode of, of service and uh, by globalizing it, both have better coverage and, and much more affordable pricing. And how many grocery bags can you fit in your vehicle and what would be a typical uh, delivery distance that you would service? Yeah, so we're, uh, we've been able to fit, uh, when we really squeeze it, something like 15 uh, bags, uh, but if they're like fully loaded, more like eight to 10 grocery bags can fit in the wagon, uh, you know, in excess of, like I said, if it's an electric wheelchair type design, you know, they can routinely carry 300 plus pounds, but we try to cap things that are around 150 pounds. Um, and our target service area is a three mile radius from the store or hub where the, the order is being loaded. Um, the, the nice thing about not focusing on on-demand hot food is when we're going at an average speed of, of three miles per hour, uh, we, we can provide a two-hour delivery window for, for a pretty big area. Uh, if you're focused on on-demand hot food, uh, the, the slow path is not going to work as well because people want things within 30 minutes. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, that, that, that's our, our core focus is, is three-mile radius. Uh, grocery, parcel, and retail. 
So uh, people can go to your website, tortoise.dev, last mile delivery, and see um, a picture of this if you want to imagine it. Um, I just have one question about the vehicle is when are you going to get the turtle shell roof on the top? <laughs> <laughs> well, well the, the reason we're not uh, not going all the way there, uh, is we actually let our, our customers, whether it be a grocery chain or a logistics company or retailer, we let them brand the cart. Um, since we're we're not going with a network model, we we, we empower our, our customers to use this as uh, as part of their fulfillment network. So we don't we uh, we don't need the world to know it's a tortoise cart. We want to make our customers shine. Great, um, <clears throat> Julia. Listening to these guys describe, we've got <laughs> automated things on the sidewalk. We've got them in the bike lane. When you, uh, as a city, hear about autonomous delivery, automated delivery, people driving things over the internet, what are the, the first things that cities are thinking about? What are the questions or concerns that you have about this type of delivery service, you know, versus a guy on a cargo bike, you know, delivering a pizza? Yeah, great question, Michelle. And I have to say, I'm with you. I'm ready for Mario or Princess Peach or Luigi to come out of any of those uh, tourist <laughs> spots. Um, so when I'm looking at a new transportation technology, I start with three questions. Who will this help? Who will this hurt? And what are other creative ways that this technology can be used apart from what the business is pitching me? So with regards to autonomous delivery, whether it's on the sidewalk or on the street, there's about a thousand other questions that come to mind. Um, I think about how can they operate safely with everything else that we've got going on in the sidewalks and the streets. How will they interact with people with disabilities, with parents pushing strollers, with people waiting for public transit, with outdoor dining, with street vendors, with people experiencing homelessness? You know, will they help local businesses and create local jobs? Or is this really about working with big chains and taking away local jobs and putting them elsewhere? Um, what will they be carrying? You know, and is it just food and groceries? Or what happens when there's not a human on the other end to receive it? And I think, you know, one big question, too, is are these mobile vending machines, fridges on wheels, are they really even autonomous? So beyond all of those questions, though, Michelle, I think one of the key concerns from policymakers is just about privatization of public space. The pandemic has revealed how much we rely on streets and sidewalks for moving people and for moving goods, uh, but also as parks and outdoor dining spaces and safe spaces for people to walk around and to see other people from a distance. So I don't think we're ready or willing to jeopardize that, this idea of having the public right of way still be public space. Um, so any company and any city that's contemplating this is, is really thinking about uh, how do we avoid that and how do we really provide local benefit to businesses, to people, to create jobs. Great. So prior to COVID, I think many people were skeptical of delivery especially this sort of last mile, you know, short, short distance delivery. Uh, I know in San Francisco, they referred to it as assisted living for millennials. Um, you know, how lazy are you that you need your beer delivered or your pizza? You really can't go a, a mile down the street to get your own burrito. Um, why engage in all this technology, et cetera, uh, just to do this, kind of uh, short-term delivery. Um, Dimitri, maybe you could address this. How did COVID come along and, and kind of change the view of what the use case is for delivery, who needs it, why you might use it, and why does automated delivery make sense? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think COVID has, you know, the, the best way it's been summarized is this accelerated the transition to e-commerce by about five years. Uh, and so we're, we're now living in 2025 from a consumer behavior point of view. And it was you know first sparked by, by safety considerations. People either weren't comfortable or weren't allowed to, to go to a grocery store or to, to go to a retail store. Um, and now convenience has taken over. Once people have uh, realized how, how nice it is to have things delivered to you and not to have to use your car uh, and, and sit in traffic to, to, to get goods to, to come to you, that, that's becoming the, the default new behavior. Uh, 
from a market development point of view, the, the other really big shift that's happened is uh, curbside pickup. And so from, from a tortoise vantage point, what, what got us really excited about pushing into last mile delivery is that every retailer now had to figure out their own pick and pack operations just to support curbside pickup. And so in a world where you can get an order fulfilled out of existing retail footprints uh, and all you need to do is solve the problem of, of how do you get the goods from the store to the, the sidewalk in front of the customer's home, that's a much more manageable problem than both having to solve pick and pack and, and solving last mile delivery. So, so to summarize from our vantage point, uh, you know, we, we were living through an unprecedented shift in consumer behavior and the, the, the retail and grocery marketplace and you know, food as well, uh, they've all had to change their operations in terms of uh, supporting delivery and, and adapting to this new world. Yeah. Um, Matt, your business has expanded uh, with COVID. What are the different use cases that you're seeing? Your vehicle obviously goes a little bit faster. Um, what what are the use cases and why should cities, as Julia pointed out, you know, why should cities view this as uh, a positive? Are you taking car trips off the road? Like, what are the benefits both for supporting small and local business, as Julia mentioned, as well as um, improving traffic flow for deliveries? Uh, well, I'd echo everything that Dimitri said. And then uh, I guess for us, we're also looking at, at prepared food. And, and I think to this idea of, of what might be in for cities, um, I think that COVID was really interesting in, in stressing and kind of revealing some of the challenges and weaknesses with the existing um, infrastructure we had in place to facilitate restaurants, uh, particularly getting their food to their customers. And so when we got into this, uh, you know, our original proposition was, oh, look, you know, the, the big players in this market are taking a large chunk of the revenue that restaurants would normally have, and we can do it for a lower cost. But what's really interesting post COVID is that that model, uh, particularly the revenue share model that the DoorDashes and Grubhub and Uber Eats of the world were, were pushing forward, um, ended up taking such a large percentage of the um, sort of revenue that restaurants were making off food that sort of in this COVID world where you take everybody that used to be dining in and, and you remove them, um, it, it really laid bare how difficult that was as a model for restaurants to do that sustainably. Um, so that only really encouraged us to try to double down and, and to that point about local restaurants. If you're McDonald's, you can negotiate a pretty good deal with DoorDash. Uh, you don't pay 30% revenue share, but if you're a mom and pop pizza spot, you don't have that market power. And so one of the first things we heard from, from the restaurants we were working with was just like, I can't pay 30% revenue share because I'll go out of business. And so uh, from that perspective, we hope that this is the thing that enables um, jobs there. And then the second bit of this is that I think the other thing that the pandemic really highlighted is how your um, uh, uh, 1099 workers, the kind of gig economy workers, were really on the front line of a lot of the um, challenges here. They were out when nobody else wanted to be, and they were bringing food to people that didn't want to leave their houses. And so we thought, you know, one of the other pieces of this is contactless delivery, but also not putting those people at risk um, is an interesting dynamic because not everybody wanted to sign up to be, um, uh, you know, a essential worker um, when they were just uh, doing a couple hours of DoorDash on the weekends. So I think both of those things were things that we looked at and said, look, I think there's there's some things that we can bring here that that may hopefully um, um, help to alleviate some of these problems and, and offer an alternative to at least the existing way that it's being done. Yeah. Julia, um, many small businesses and restaurants are, are struggling during COVID. And, you know, you mentioned the uses of the sidewalk and outdoor dining and things like that. But delivery really has been a lifeline for many small businesses. How is Los Angeles thinking about helping small businesses and restaurants to reduce costs of delivery, to make these kind of services feasible, um, especially in areas that have fewer food choices? Sure. It's a fantastic question, and I'll echo many of the points that Matt made, uh, but in a different context, in the L.A. context. So in the L.A. area, the restaurant industry has lost 40% of its jobs since the start of the pandemic, so 4-0. And 62% of our small and medium enterprises aren't expected to recover, ever. 
And this is a huge blow for us. I mean, it's a blow to our economy. It's a blow to our culture. Um, and one of my favorite parts about living in LA is the food culture, especially the fact that you can go to restaurants in strip malls, restaurants at food trucks. Uh, you know, our signature dish is a bulgogi taco, if you could even call uh, one dish a signature di dish in LA. So I think when we're thinking about policies and programs um, that we can stand up from the mayor's office that helps restaurants and small businesses, I mean, we're thinking and doing everything that we can. Um, so what does that mean? You know, in terms of programs that help make pickups easier, uh, we were one of the you know, first cities to uh, stand up a program where restaurants and retail stores could ask and receive uh, free temporary curbside pickup zones. And those pickup zones are still in place today. Um, we have plans in the future to make some of those permanent and also to be able to leverage digital infrastructure um, to be able to facilitate that more easily in the future where we would have loved to be able to just press a button and say, now this pickup zone is, or now this parking spot is a pickup zone or an outdoor dining area uh, rather than doing all of that manually. Um, we also have programs to make deliveries cheaper. So one of the things that I worked on with our city council was a food delivery fee cap ordinance. Uh, that limits the deliveries and other fees that third-party delivery services can charge to restaurants to 20% total. Because we were having the same issue um, that Matt described in Michigan, which is that for many restaurants, they were seeing a third of their revenues per month uh, go to uh, those third-party delivery services. We also recently launched a partnership with PayPal and with Ritual um, to help LA-based restaurants get all of their operations online for free and to do um, some of that payment processing also for free um, so that they would have an easier time of transitioning to our digital world uh, and to having deliveries and pickups happen uh, through that way rather than through what they were used to, which was, you know, phone calls and, and uh, sending somebody to, to the door. Um, and then, you know, finally, we have programs that help bring food to people. So you mentioned, Michelle, uh, food deserts. Uh, we also had many people who were made homebound by the pandemic, uh, and our, our seniors in LA are one you know, such group. Uh, so early on in the pandemic, we also stood up a senior meal uh, emergency response program. And the idea behind that, and again, it still continues today, is that we needed to get meals to people who had no one else to help them um, and who uh, really uh, needed uh, taxi companies in this case to deliver them 10 healthy meals a week that were cooked by the 31 restaurants who are now, 31 restaurants rather, who are now in the program. Um, and 65% of those folks, those seniors, were uh, in a household that had an income below $25,000 per year. So that is a, a, sh a short-term program. We hope to make elements of that uh, medium-term or long-term, uh, but I think you know we have some long-term policies too that are, are really focused on reorienting um, where food is and where people live. Uh, supporting things like the cottage food industry, which I know is being discussed in another panel, um, and also setting up things like good fo food zones where um, folks can uh, uh, be supported when they are starting up food businesses in food deserts. And uh, we would love to be able to do more. We'd love to hear from other folks within uh, this panel, uh, well, not just this panel, but within this event series uh, who are interested in doing more in LA. Great. When you mentioned the the economics of it and the fee caps, which you know are kind of controversial in various cities uh, as to what the right approach is, um, Dimitri, how do you think about the economics of automating delivery and the service that Tortoise is providing versus what the alternatives would be for restaurants in terms of? hiring their own delivery guys or or using other other modes how do you think about the economics so i think there's a twofold impact so so by uh deploying automation technologies like like teleoperations and and globalizing it we're, we're able to on a per delivery basis make it about two to three times cheaper than your your next best alternative uh today and um, the, the, the second big piece of it is, you know, we, we see ourselves as equalizers uh, leveling the playing field for smaller grocers, smaller retailers, smaller restaurants, uh, so, so that they have technology at their disposal. So, so when they're competing against Uber Eats, DoorDash, uh, and Amazon, uh, that, that it's a fair fight. Um, and, and I think, you know, I mean, Shopify has done a lot of this on the, on kind of the pure digital front. And, and I think, 
there's a lot of work to be done on, on the delivery front there. Uh, and a big part of that is, is empowering uh, grocers, restaurants, retailers to own their own demand funnel. And so that's one of the reasons we let our customers brand their tortoise cart is we think of it as a really powerful out of home marketing engine and you, you can't own your destiny unless you own your customer. And, uh, and, and so we think grocers, retailers, you know, if they're not owning the top of the funnel, they're, they're, they're at a very precarious position. Um, and so, uh, so I think it's twofold impact. We, we have to increase the, the top of the funnel and then we have to make delivery dramatically more affordable where it's, you know, anybody can, can afford it. And it's not just uh, wealthy people who, who can kind of have the, the safer, more convenient option. And what do you charge? Uh, you're, you're forging partnerships with grocery stores, the, gro the carts, the tortoise carts actually live at the grocery store, so they're already there and, and are available for this kind of back-end delivery yeah. service that you're offering. How are you charging for that? How do you think about the price comparison between what you charge and uh, you know, someone in a car doing a human delivery? So, um, so, so lease, you know, kind of in the low hundred dollars a month range per cart, and then on a per mile basis uh, of around a uh, dollar to a dollar fifty. And, uh, and so, you know, it also depends on how you use us in terms of the total per delivery cost. So if you're batching together several orders, which you can do because our cart can have up to four different containers in it that, that all have their own uh, separate Bluetooth lock. Um, you know, if you're batching together, you know, four deliveries on a two mile route, um, so two miles there, two miles back, that's gonna be less than a dollar per delivery. Um, so, so, you know, it, it can be a pretty dramatic reduction. You know, we're, we're generally targeting making it two to three times cheaper than the next best alternative available to, to a grocer. But, but for us, the, given the low speed and the per mile model, we constrain ourselves to that two and a half mile, three mile radius from a store or hub. Um, because somebody, you know, if you're doing a 10 mile delivery, a 15 mile delivery, we're, we're going to be more expensive. Um, and so we're, we're kind of focused on, uh, on those shorter deliveries um, and, uh, and yeah, targeting that two to three X reduction. Matt, your service, um, you know, you've been doing deliveries for restaurants. Um, how have you thought about serving kind of main street businesses? Uh, in, you know, you're providing a back end kind of like a, a stripe or a square where you're just kind of the service, the delivery layer. Can you explain how that works, how it's different from like a DoorDash model, and then how you might be able to serve a, a wider variety of Main Street type businesses? Yeah, well, I guess uh, it's gonna be a not very controversial panel because I'm gonna echo what Dimitri said <laughs> in a lot of ways. We um, we believe that, yeah, that customers, um, that restaurants wanna be as close to their customers as they can. And to that, it's it's different than the DoorDash model, right, where they aggregate those customers and bring them in. And so then the restaurants are, are sort of, to some degree, um, detached from those customers in that they don't have, they don't own that relationship. And some of this aggregation, in fact, uh, it seems to hurt kind of Main Street businesses because algorithmically, your DoorDashes of the world can can redirect business. If I search pizza in my area, they have a lot of control about where that ends up going and, and who they promote and then the fee structures with that, et cetera. Um, so for us, again, we wanna enable individual businesses to be able to do this and like Stripe, you know, in that same model, um, without having to hire your own delivery, first party delivery staff, we wanna offer a very similar um, quality of service, right? Where they own those relationships with the customers, they get to ensure that deliveries happen in a timely manner and all those kind of things that you would want if you had your own first party delivery service, but without the expense, um, because it really is um, fairly both expensive and logistically difficult, not just because it's expensive to do so, but also because these large players have in many ways crowded others out of the market. If you wanna go hire a delivery driver, um, you're competing with DoorDash, Grubhub, Uber Eats now, and it's actually much harder than it was even 10 years ago. Um, and so there's a lot of dynamics there. Um, and so for us, we think that it should be easy for a restaurant to access delivery logistics, and it should hopefully be inexpensive. And our belief is that the largest um, piece of that cost right now is um, labor. And so by trying to go with autonomous vehicles, we think that that's going to decrease that. And, you know, I, I think that fee caps are uh, an example of 
why of, of how the model is not working for people right now, right? So it's not working for restaurants. And one of the other ironic bits of it is it's not also working for the DoorDashes of the world, right? They're losing money on deliveries. And so it's not working for anybody. So it seems like that is ripe for some um, technology advance, hopefully, to make it profitable, right? The end of the day is you hope the delivery provider is making money. You want the restaurant to make money. You want the customers to be happy. And uh, I'd say in the current system, that is not true for almost anybody in that. Um, so uh, hopefully room for improvement. Yeah. So how do you charge uh, the businesses? And, you know, it's interesting, both you and um, Dimitri are talking about essentially a, a B2B model, mm -hmm. right? Where you're, yep. you're having the relationship with the business, you're not consumer facing. Um, how do you charge for your, is it a flat fee for each delivery? Does it differ based on how far away it is or how, how do you price your service? We're charging a flat fee right now. And so that's seven fifty, and that comes in if you're um, a restaurant dealing with uh, um, what would normally be a, a revenue share plus a fee on the other side. And the restaurant's uh, able to pass any of that onto the customer or none of it onto the customer. And so if you think about what customers are typically paying now, anywhere from 3 to $7 um, in fees and then tip on top of that. Um, the restaurant has a little bit of room to play there. And so we have some of our restaurant partners that pass on um, a lot of that fee um, to the customer um, for their economics and then some that pass on none because they're much more interested in doing volume. Um, but we, again, we've been able to find that it's been um, anywhere from you know half to even a third of what restaurants are paying on large ticket orders with the revenue share that they were getting without sort of the market power to negotiate. Um, and it's the same model as, as what Dimitri was talking about, giving the restaurants the ability to, to get directly to the customer. You could have, we should have picked some different people. You could have more controversial uh, opinions here, but I guess we all agree. So that's good. So um, just so people understand when you talk about your model being different and so you're not putting up any kind of a website that's consumer facing at all for your business. Instead, each business would just have their own website. And so a restaurant, a mom and pop restaurant on Main Street might take phone orders. They might take orders on their own website. However it is they get the orders, then they decide, uh, okay, some portion of these are pickup and some portion are delivery. And then they decide how to fulfill those deliveries and they might send some to you and they might use some other service okay. if it if they need a longer distance or what have you. Um, mm -hmm. So when we talk about it being a comparison of offering a service to small businesses, mm -hmm. uh, how can you expand that? Um, it seems like the advantage of it is you don't have to have a vertical. You don't have to say like, I'm going to service dry cleaners now and I've got to put up a whole website that is dedicated to that. You can pretty much do one offs for anyone on Main Street, right? Like you could do a florist delivery, a dry cleaner, um, you know, any type of shop. All they have to do is have their own website, their own means of getting an order. And then you fulfill it kind of as a back end service. That's exactly right. And, and we're agnostic to what's being transported in some ways. And, and in fact, Julie already hit on this, but the thing is that this was not a model that seemed viable pre pandemic because there was this big concern like, well, how much, how many websites, how many restaurants are doing this themselves? You know, you know, pre pandemic, a lot of this was DoorDash offered a pretty complete service and you didn't have to have a whole e commerce or infrastructure for that. The big change has been with this kind of emptying out of the dining rooms, you've seen almost everybody decide they need to, at the very least, offer curbside. And so what has happened is this, uh, again, as Dimitri highlighted earlier, this huge advancement in, in how quickly you saw restaurants adapt. Because I think at the end of the day, one of the things that's really interesting to us working with restaurants is you realize that they're incredibly, you don't think of it as a, as a really um, dynamic business, but it is, they're incredibly sensitive to market forces. They're incredibly sensitive to what's happening out there because they have to be, the margins are very small, the comp competition's very high. And so as soon as it became clear that there was not gonna be dining in for an unknown period of time, uh, every restaurant that we worked with here had set up their own uh, e-commerce platform almost immediately. And you see the rise of point of sale systems like Toast and others that are really realizing this because restaurants have to adapt because otherwise they die. And, and we've seen the same kind of carnage here in our restaurant industry. Uh, half the places that I love to go to have shut over the last six months. And so it really is, I think, um, it's hopefully a time where we, we use this sort of real crisis to figure out if there are ways of 
of um, doing something different. To build on oh, my line got disconnected, but to build on that, the um, uh, in the pre-pandemic world, the only reason the 30% DoorDash Uber Eats fee worked is because those online orders were incremental to dine-in costs that you already were incurring. So, so you're fine giving up 30% because it's it's not you know you know the cost of the food is uh, is, is is marginal at that point, and you don't need additional labor uh, to support those orders. Now that 70% of your business, 80% of your business is all online facilitated, they're you know it's just the 30 percent will will not work and it's uh it's, it's unfeasible um and uh we're, we're basically asking for a disaster if, if that's the only model available to independent restaurants how does this scale like how do how, how long would it take do you think this is a permanent change now that everybody's got their website or their pick and pack grocery operation you know worked out do you think this is a permanent change post COVID and how does it scale? How do you get to a place where you have a lot of automated deliveries kind of saving people money and, and providing this kind of service and reducing car trips and things like that? Uh, I'll, I'll just say what we've been thinking about is that, um, you know, our hope is that as the technology gets better and as there's more adoption from cities and as regulation gets more robust, that we're gonna see hopefully a slow and steady growth. I'm a proponent, at least from the autonomy perspective, that we don't do sort of the scooter model. I, I don't envision um, thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of robots being dumped on a city and immediately taking off. That, that seems really unlikely to me for a variety of reasons, um, but I do really believe in a lot of this technology and I think we're gonna see this in increasing march of, of adoption simply because it offers an alternative in some places where there is not a good set of um, options. And so I think because the market is going to crave that, it's, it's going to persist. And then, and then to the question of, of kind of these consumer behavior changes, it, is, it seems highly unlikely to me. I mean, I've seen it even in my own life that my parents had never used Instacart prior to the pandemic. They started using it. Now, there's a question, right? Once, the, if if we get to the point where there isn't, uh, which seems increasingly further out, but where there isn't <laughs> incredible community spread in the United States, um, does everybody just go back to doing what they did? And, and it just doesn't seem like that comports with any of the other trends we've seen in sort of these behavior changes before, right? Once people learn a new system that offers some level of convenience, that offers some level of service that's better than what they had before, or at least an alternative that they can use in conjunction with what they had before. It seems highly unlikely to me that everybody just says, well, let's never use our phones to order groceries again. Let's just go back to um, all going to the grocery store. And I know that like it's now integrated with my Amazon. They want me to get Whole Foods deliveries. There's so many ways that you see this sort of coming together. It, it seems um, strikingly unlikely to me that somehow this doesn't persist, but you never know. Yeah, the, the, the key to locking in the, the behavior change is actually to get the cost of delivery lower, right? I think once you start using enough Instacart and people get wise to the fact that sometimes you're paying 40% more all in, uh, you know, the, all the fees plus the, uh, the, the food markup, um, you know, if, if that doesn't change then people will revert to, to some of the, the, the old, you know, kind of the, the past behaviors. But I think the, the other analogy is uh, what's happened with same day and on-demand delivery it's kind of like what happened with, with e-commerce 10 years ago, where 10 years ago, everybody was afraid of putting their credit card on the internet. And, you know, after you've done it five times, you're no longer afraid. And I think that's, you know, we've kind of gotten past that point of critical mass where a huge part of the population has done same day delivery enough times where, where it's, it's, it's kind of locked in that behavior change. And we just need to make it economically not a stupid decision. Uh, which I think automation is going to play a, a big role in doing. I would just add, though, Michelle, that this is not the first time that cities are seeing automated sidewalk lots. And I know San Francisco, D.C. had passed early pilot permits or regulations around them. And I think there's still some skepticism about whether they're here to stay or if this is really just a technology of circumstance. And I think one of the things that that hinges on is whether sidewalk bots are just a piece of the puzzle and uh, businesses, restaurants, whatever, get sort of a menu of options of how things can be delivered, or if it's the, the puzzle itself, uh, if there's really just one option that they have. And I think 
you know, that's how we're kind of thinking about it in LA too, is um, how much regulation do we want to stand up right now when this is still something that's really being proven out from a business model perspective. Um, and if we're going to do that, you know, and make that investment, uh, we want to make sure that this is a technology that works for folks and that works for businesses in particular. Yeah, let, let's talk a little bit about regulation. I know people wonder how, um, you know, how will people, how will cities manage with different robots on the sidewalk or in a bike lane? And how do you have, you know, competing uses? And as you point out, it's a little bit of chicken and egg. And, you know, cities, um, often get surprised by things and they want to get out ahead of regulating new mobility. On the other hand, sometimes you don't know what you're dealing with or whether it's even worth putting a program in place until businesses have a chance to try out a use case. And so, uh, Julia, how do you balance sort of allowing innovation and also trying to, um, you know, manage things like clutter and chaos uh, at the curb. Yeah, I mean, so we're, like I mentioned, just thinking about that now, because there's actually a vacuum of regulation, both at the state of California level and then also at the local level in L.A. And so when we're looking at other cities, you know, we've seen that other cities are regulating automated sidewalk bots based on operational goals. So things like safety, speed, vehicle size, uh, things that actually are different between the, the two other folks on the, the panel here in terms of um, the technologies they represent. Uh, but also things like insurance and liability. Indemnification is a huge thing. Uh, how many bots do you have in the fleet? When and where are they going and how are they allowed to operate? And also what's the level of autonomy and what is um, the level of responsibility that the company takes on when they've got the bots again in the public right of way? So I think with this next wave, though, and what we're seeing now, because we do believe that there's going to be a change in people's behavior, there already is. And while that might not be exactly the same, and we honestly hope it's not exactly the same as we've experienced during the pandemic, uh, likely some of it is going to be systemic. So um, for that reason, we're also pursuing some aspirational goals in addition to the operational goals. So making sure that anything is going to be zero emissions, um, that it's going to avoid vehicle trips, that it's going to help local businesses, which I've said multiple times, create local jobs, which I've also said multiple times, and also contribute to things like uh, infrastructure assessment, state of repair, you know, how are we doing in terms of um, taking care of the public right of way. And then I think also fundamentally, we don't want to change uh, or uh, harm urban design and how uh, the way that people experience the street. Uh, especially in LA because it is so hard to be a pedestrian and a cyclist and someone who's walking or rolling right now. Um, so further degrading that experience is uh, certainly something we're against. And I think that's true in terms of, you know, how sensitive we are to community feedback about anything we allow in the public right of way. And, uh, you know, LA generally takes this yes and approach to things. So we're cool with you trying it out here, <laughs> but uh, we want to say yes and uh, so that we can co-create it with you and we can make sure that it's meeting certain goals. And uh, you mentioned early on, Michelle, in my intro that um, I'm a board member of Urban Movement Labs, which was a, a nonprofit that was initially incubated in the mayor's office and, and by my team. Uh, precisely for this purpose. So we knew that there needed to be a bit of a policy sandbox that um, as the interim executive director of Urban Movement Lab says, the city can't always be a facilitator and a regulator. Sometimes it has to choose. Uh, and so uh, with Urban Movement Labs, we get the opportunity for to allow for somebody else to be the facilitator um, and to allow the city to be the regulator and to really um, use these early tests as ways to think about, is this providing value to folks? Is this providing uh, the ability for the city to get closer to its goals, uh, whether it's you know equity or accessibility or climate change? Climate action, not climate change. <laughs> 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 so um, how are, in other states, uh, Dimitri and Matt, how, how are cities and states regulating these delivery devices? Are there a couple of different types of frameworks that you're seeing? What is the most common? How are you guys um, addressing regulation as you try to roll out your businesses? So Matt, and I think we'll again agree on this point, but uh, <laughs> the, the kind of state of play right now is there's about a dozen states that have passed uh, personal delivery device laws. 
um, that are actually because they were uh, funded uh, by FedEx and Amazon uh, end up being very business friendly and, and kind of, uh, you know, more of the uh, ask for forgiveness, not permission, laying out some minimum standards on insurance, uh, but otherwise uh, more of a laissez-faire approach. Um, and so there, there's those dozen states. And then as, uh, as Julia mentioned, you know, most cities, there's just no existing law that really contemplates this one way or another, you know, with, with the exception of, you know, I'd say that the one city that's, that's kind of passed the, we don't want this law is, is San Francisco, um, where kind of they, they set regulations that were so onerous that, uh, you know, besides just doing a test without customers, you, you can't really uh, use the technology in, in San Francisco. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's, it's kind of a mixed bag. I, I think the U.S. is farther along than most other countries. And then within the U.S., you have some states that, that are very permissive. And, and, but you, I mean, I think COVID is acting as a great accelerator uh, where you now have a bunch of cities that, you know, are very curious about this and, and kind of see the, the upside of zero emissions, taking cars off the road, contactless, and uh, making last mile delivery something that, that's more affordable and equitable. Yeah, yeah what, again, I'll echo. Sorry, yeah. yeah. What, um, w- from a company perspective, from an innovation perspective, what are you looking for from regulators? What's the most helpful thing on your end? Is it consistency? Is it, you know, same rules across multiple cities? How, what is helpful from a company perspective? I mean, I think, you know, if you talk to any entrepreneur, uh, having some ability to forecast into the future and you know, the, the, your, one of your biggest enemies is uncertainty. So uh, it certainly doesn't help to have varying regulation or regulation that's going to be uncertain or changing. But I think we're in, a, we're in a time where it's just, it reflects that we're sort of on the cusp of a lot of these things um, moving into cities that they hadn't been in before. And there's just, just a lot of change. So that's one of the biggest things. Um, I think one of the things that has been really advantageous for this is that uh, self-driving car companies came around six years ago and told everybody that it's going to be here tomorrow. And so you need to have regulation in place to do it. And so we were really lucky here in Michigan, right? Like that regulation paved quite a bit of the way for autonomous vehicles here. They didn't show up, but it didn't really matter because the regulation was already in place. And so in many ways, uh, we've been able to take advantage of that. And so um, there's regulation here that says that autonomous vehicles are allowed to operate on the um, roads in Michigan. And that was sort of the entry point for us to be able to start operating, uh, I think, much sooner and with a lot less uncertainty than we would have had had nobody else tried this before um, with any type of vehicle of any stripe on any um, any platform. But all the other things that Dimitri said, I just would echo um, from that perspective. Yeah. So, so, so I'll share a funny anecdote, like in terms of uh, a don't, a don't uh, from uh, what, what cities uh, probably shouldn't be doing is, is you know, I, I won't name the city, uh, but there's a, a major uh, major city that is really interested in personal delivery devices. They're not in a state that has a state law, but their their main question is like, can we start charging fees for for these delivery robots? And uh, and kind of the the constructive feedback I gave is like, sure, but shouldn't you be charging fees for every other delivery? That's like you know like don't don't kind of pick on the the new guy uh, that is uh, by the way the zero emission solution that's contactless um, and so I think it's uh, you know the, the the approach we encourage is like you know be honest about assessing the status quo and the problems that exist with you know non automated forms of delivery and and then you know when you're thinking about regulations for for personal delivery devices kind of right size that against you know some of the glaring issues that, that are already live today and aren't being addressed with uh with other regulations yeah and dimitri, dimitri, to be, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just, i'll respond to that um <laughs> dimitri to be fair we would like to pick on the old guys too uh and not just the new guys uh, it is truly a free market when it comes to picking on anyone uh when you're a, a city official but uh on that you know from that respect too i think I'm actually, I spent most of my career in the private sector and I'm relatively new to the public sector, all things considered. And I'm all for innovation, but also seeing it on the other side of the fence now, um, recognize you know how much it is the responsibility of the city and how many phone calls we get when things go wrong. And so um, some of those fees or fines or permitting or whatever else um, is really just about 
the, the fundamental responsibility that the city has to whoever's living there. Um, and I think, you know, that's sort of the framework that we're putting in, not the framework of let's try to quash all innovation so that we never have anything new at all. Um, uh, so anyways, just to, some more food for yeah, thought. To be fair, Los Angeles was not the situation. <laughs> that was an awkward, yeah. Fantastic compared to all of our conversations, so. Well, I think, you know, it's interesting um, how many phone calls cities get about things like a sidewalk delivery bot versus how many SUVs are parked in the bike lane, parked in the crosswalk, up on the sidewalk. You don't get phone calls about those. And so suddenly the regulate, you know, I think the as Dimitri points out, you know, sometimes the biggest, most onerous vehicles on the, you know, around aren't getting the regulation. But the little tiny bots that are, you know, new, um, sometimes people feel like there's more attention there, but I think it's just the nature of human beings that when we see something new, we're more likely to pick up the phone and, and complain about it. Uh, I guess we've all become numb to, to cars. Um, but uh, any other questions in the audience? I've tried to um, address a little bit some of the questions in the chat, but if anyone has other questions for the panel, feel free to drop it in. Um, as we're finishing up here. Um, how do you see the bike lane? Um, you know, I think there, people in the micromobility space and in the delivery space are starting to look at reallocation of roadway space, you know, and starting to say, well, where can we carve out the space? And sometimes the bicyclists are the ones who say, well, wait a sec, I don't want those micromobility people in our lane and, and delivery bots, oh gosh, that's too big and that's too fast. And and how are we going to all fit in the, the this much of the roadway that's given over to a bike lane? Um, when you think in Los Angeles, Julia, how do you think about road space? Should we have like a, a mindset of abundance and say, look, if there are actually this many micromobility delivery carts in the thing we'll just we'll come up with another lane or are you just going to kind of wait and see or how do you think about those kind of conflicts for the available space it's a great question and something that we think about daily especially as we're um, setting up programs like slow streets which I, I might have mentioned earlier um, and that's where we're closing off local streets uh, to anything but local traffic so it allows for pedestrian cyclists, anybody who wants to use the street in a different way than normally is used um, to, to be able to do that. And I think what we're finding is that that program, Slow Streets, you know, outdoor dining has been incredibly successful. And it's been the thing that, you know, folks uh, talk to us about the most as, as something that they want to make permanent. Um, and so what that means for us is, you know, fundamentally in LA, we've got 17% of our footprint that is just streets uh, compared to something like 13% parks. Um, so when we think about how do we want to allocate space, uh, we want to allocate space for people. And so I think, you know, we, like many other cities, um, uh, adopt sort of a transportation hierarchy that places people at the top and then goes down from there. Um, where the sidewalk delivery bots end up on that hierarchy, I think it's it's not going to be the top, uh, if that's any uh, um, uh, question, um, but it also won't be the, the bottom either. Um, and so, you know, the things, the types of things that we're looking at in the future are not only how do we create separated bike lanes for people so that they really feel comfortable using those bike lanes, but actually how can we create mobility lanes or slow lanes um, that are reserved for people who are things um, that are going at slower speeds. Uh, because, you know, we're sort of intimately familiar with SUVs and the general lack of safety that, that people feel and also experience on streets. Um, so we're trying to look at both the infrastructure and policy decisions uh, that really, again, reserve space for making people feel safe. Great. So Dimitri and Matt, why don't we finish up? Um, maybe you guys could tell us what your plans are in the coming year. What do you? Are there new locations that you're interested in? Um, even if you're not ready to announce actual launches, are there kind of cities and states or or types of cities that you're interested in having discussions with uh, moving forward? And uh, how? What kind of a ramp or or launch scale are, are you thinking about? 
Uh, for us, we're going to have 25 vehicles here in Ann Arbor, and that's going to be, um, for a city this size, a, a pretty um, sizable fleet of robots carrying around. And so we're really excited to begin to understand uh, what that looks and feels like over a kind of more sustained period of time. Um, uh, probably over the next year, we're hoping to expand uh, to a few other cities, probably starting here in Michigan, um, but then elsewhere. Um, uh, again, as highlighted, there's a lot of states now that are sort of set up from a regulatory standpoint to do this. Um, but I think it's for us, it's really about trying to iron out the unit economics, trying to iron out the um, less the regulatory, but really the practical of having a ton of robots carrying around. I think it is going to be a, um, a transformative experience for everybody that lives in this community. And I think uh, we plan to learn a lot because um, right now, when I look out my window, uh, a couple times a day, I'll see the robot, which is already a pretty big change. Um, and so I think it's going to be, uh, I'm hoping it's an interesting and exciting year for us to learn more about what it means to have that many robots um, doing their thing. How many deliveries a day are you doing now typically? And what do you think it would look like with, with 25 uh, robots? So each robot can do between five and, and kind of 15 deliveries, depending on how far they are. So our hope is to be sort of um, doing um, a couple hundred a day um, when we get to sort of maximum saturation. But that is a far cry from where we are right now. So um, uh, still a lot to be learned. And so in terms of other cities, are you looking for cities kind of similar size to Ann Arbor, like 100, 150,000 people? Or are you looking at bigger cities? Or? We're looking at bigger cities, but really the way we're thinking about it is these pods that will have, again, 25 robots that will be serving areas that are sort of of this size. Again, this this notion of a three and a half mile radius really means it is hyper local in the way that you, you deploy it. So imagine a city like Boston, imagine a city like New York. There isn't, you know, there's not like one pod that serves all of that. So we really are thinking about replicating this exact model we have here in a number of neighborhoods um, to serve the restaurants and grocery stores that are in that neighborhood in the community that that sits around it. So that's our hope for moving forward. Great, Dimitri. What's your outlook for the next year? Are there cities or states or types of cities you're thinking about uh, expanding? Yeah, well, I mean, we're really excited about one of the cities that's come up uh, a lot in the conversation today, but we're not announcing it quite yet. Um, we're, uh, you know, the, the, the nice thing about our model being not network based is we're happy to go into a city with just two parts, right? We're working with one customer and um, we don't need kind of a critical uh, mass of, uh, of, of deliveries kind of running through our system to, to have it make sense from, from our vantage point. Um, and the, the other really nice thing about not focusing on autonomy is we don't need to do a lot of heavy mapping up front. Um, so we, we can send a cart into a community and within a few days of, uh, of just doing some local testing, it could start doing deliveries. Um, so, so the path to quick ramping is, is there. Uh, we're, we're, you know, we've started this month and you know, as, as Julia was mentioning, it's important to first get the community feedback and, and make both uh, operational changes and, and you know, if any kind of hardware adjustments are needed. Um, and so we want to go deep in, in the first few communities we're working with, get that community feedback. Um, but, but, you know, our cart is cheap to build. It only costs $3,000 and uh, uh, it's easy to get into a lot of communities. And so, you know, the second we, we feel good about the community feedback, we want to move fast because we, we think we're solving a lot of important problems on, on the climate front, the equity front, and the safety front. Great. And so just to finish, um, Julia, how can people get in touch with you if, if they're interested in, in talking with uh, Los Angeles about new products, new services? What's the best way to get in touch with you? Sure. So two ways. Um, one, you can go through Urban Movement Labs, which, as I mentioned, was uh, spun out of the city, but um, still one of our key partners in terms of trialing out any of the new technology. So that's urbanmovementlabs.com. And then the second is you can email me, and it's julia.bain at lacity.org. Happy to answer any other questions. Great. And Dimitri, what's the best way to get in touch with Tortoise? Yeah, so uh, you can follow me or Tortoise on Twitter. I'm, I'm at Dimitri140. Tortoise is at TortoiseHQ. And uh, also feel free to email me. Uh, Dimitri at tortoise.dev, D-M-I-T-R-Y. 
Great. And Matt, how can people follow uh, you and reach you? I don't run our social media. I don't know anything about it. I am like the most Luddite of the group, but I guess we, we have a Twitter. I think it is like at Refraction AI. I think it has my name on it. People pass me messages on paper like Joe Biden uh, every day. So, you know, um, I guess that way. <laughs> Of course, the guy with the PhD and the <laughs> That's right. I don't know how to use technology, you know. <laughs> Bigger. All right. Thanks so much to everyone for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Feel free to reach out on messages. Um, there's a little direct message function in here. Uh, if you want to get any more information or need uh, need to contact anyone or get more info, feel free to reach out to me as well. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter. I'm at Michelle Kairos, so feel free to reach out. Great to see everyone. Uh, we've got a few more delivery panels today. Head over to the, uh, the reception button. You can see the menu and see the other panels that are going on right now and hop into another session. Thanks so much for joining today. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.